In June of 1941, the Third Reich launched the largest invasion in history, Operation Barbarossa, a massive attack on the Soviet Union. Over three million soldiers and 3,000 tanks stormed into the motherland in a front that was more than 2,800 kilometers long. The advance was relentless, and the German forces unstoppable. However, the brutal approach suddenly stalled with the surprising appearance of a new Soviet tank, the T-34. With a mass of 26 tons, a length of 6.7 meters, and a width of 3 meters, this medium tank was protected by an innovative, thick, sloped armor that was almost impenetrable against the German Panzer III's. What's more, the T-34's 76mm gun could easily get rid of any enemy tank. Still, the T-34's supremacy was just getting started, and the Germans were terror-stricken once the Soviets started pushing towards their own land. A necessary replacement. The origins of the T-34 medium tank date back to the 1930s, when the Soviets began to look for a replacement for the T-26 and BT series of cavalry tanks. These were small, fast, agile, and lightly armored tanks that could quickly reach the battlefield and could operate on wheels or tracks thanks to their Christie suspension, inherited from the American M 1931 Christie tank. However, the Spanish Civil War and a border war with Japan showed that both types of tanks were no longer fit for a new age of mechanized warfare. The BT-7s were quickly destroyed by anti-tank guns, and the low-powered guns of the Japanese Type 95 tanks, while one well-placed Molotov cocktail was more than enough to reduce the Soviet tanks to a flaming wreck. This led to the beginning of the Universal Tank Project in 1937, which sought to develop a powerful Red Army medium tank with thick armor, powerful guns, and good maneuverability and speed. The program's leader was designer Mikhail Koshkin, who began studying possible designs at the Kharkiv Komintern locomotive plant in Ukraine, eventually using ideas from previous Soviet tanks and the American Christie. The result was prototype A-32, later renamed T-34, to mark the year when Koshkin first envisioned the design. A sloped medium tank. The T-34 tank weighed about 26 tons and had a length of 6.68 meters, a width of 3 meters, and a height of almost 2.5 meters. In addition, it had a front armor that was 45 millimeters thick and was sloped at an angle of 60 degrees, which helped to deflect projectiles launched on a horizontal trajectory that simply bounced off the armor. The T-34 retained the coil spring Christie suspension of the BT tanks, which gave it an excellent low ground pressure that made it highly maneuverable on rough terrain, snow, and mud. Coupled with the V-12 diesel engine, the tank reached speeds of up to 53 kilometers per hour, making it faster than the Panzer III's that Germany would use at the outbreak of World War II. Another noteworthy innovation was its powerful 76mm gun, which had about 600 meters per second muzzle velocity. The first two prototypes were driven from Ukraine to Moscow in January of 1940, and Stalin was impressed by their performance as they covered over 1,200 kilometers without any issues. Stalin later dubbed the T-34 the Little Swallow. However, despite his approval to go into production, Koshkin perished only a few months after receiving the good news, losing the fight to pneumonia he had caught during the harrowing journey. He was only 42. Consequently, designer Alexander Morosov adopted the T-34 as his own creation and launched the first models into combat during the German invasion of the Soviet Union. A series of problems. The T-34 entered production in September of 1940. The first batch of 400 tanks was dubbed the Model 1940, but it was plagued by numerous problems. First, 
Due to manufacturing problems, many of the tanks were fitted with an inferior engine, the MT-17 used by the previous BTs instead of the V-12 diesel engine. This resulted in an unreliable engine, drive gear, and suspension. Second, the L-11 76mm gun proved to have insufficient power and often failed to hit targets as intended. The turret also had to be manually traversed by two men, making the commander also the gunner. And to make matters worse, the turret did not include a basket that moved the floor as the turret traversed. Additionally, the lack of radios for most tanks led to poor communication issues. Only company commanders had them, and the rest of the tankers had to communicate with flags in the middle of combat with their hatches opened. This lack of unit cohesion was augmented by poor visibility from the T-34's interior, as the tankers lacked a cupola with periscopes like other German tanks. More often than not, tank commanders would enter battle with the turret hatch opened to lead the tank and see the flags of their comrades for new orders. Coupled with these flaws, the T-34 had a cramped interior compartment due to the armor's slope, and the four men could barely move inside. This proved highly dangerous for the crew. If an armor-piercing round made its way through the interior without fully penetrating, armor splinters could hurt them all. If that was not enough, the early model 1940s had fuel cells at the sides of the hull that could also be easily breached by armor-piercing rounds. Fighting off the Germans. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, many of the faulty T 34s were the spearhead of the armored formations. In typical Soviet doctrine, they were still launched by the thousands, leading to a waste of T 34s and their crews. In desperation, many Soviet T 34 commanders ran their vehicles straight into German tanks in an effort to disable them. However, despite the T-34's shortcomings, the Germans were still surprised and struggled to counter them effectively. The Panzer III's and IV's could not engage the Soviet tanks in a frontal assault, as they could barely dent the front armor. Also, the 37mm KWK-36 and the 50mm KWK-38 anti-tank guns proved unable to damage the T-34. Consequently, the Germans had to resort to new tactics to outmatch the Soviet tank. One tactic was to work in packs to encircle the T-34s and get rid of them with flank shots. On the other hand, the here resorted to the powerful 88mm anti-aircraft guns to stop advancing T-34s, as they could effectively penetrate the sloped armor and stop. Meanwhile, in regions with no available tanks, the infantry had to use mines or discreetly approach the T-34s from behind to destroy them with satchel charges or Molotov cocktails. Upgrades As the war progressed, the Soviets improved the T-34 with more powerful variants. The T-34 model 1941 got rid of some of the early problems and replaced the main gun with a more effective F-34 76mm one. Meanwhile, model 1942 increased armor protection and simplified the tank's components to increase its production, and model 1943 introduced a hexagonal turret that earned it the nickname Mickey Mouse by German forces. Still, it went toe-to-toe -to -toe against the German Panthers during the Battle of Kursk. The T-3485 was the Soviet response to the German Panther and became the ultimate version of the tank. It perfected the strengths of the medium tank and got rid of many of its defects. This was the T-34 tank that legendary German commanders such as Heinz Guderian and von Kleist described as one of the superior medium tanks of the later war period. The Reality Documents released after the fall of the Soviet Union showed that the massed groups of T-34s that advanced towards enemy columns were more of a show-off rather than a true test of brute strength during the early Soviet offensives. According to the documents, the Russian tank groups lost 326 T-34s out of a pool of 400. 
Of this, only 66 were destroyed by the enemy, and the rest were lost to breakdowns. Reliability tests from the first two critical years showed that T-34s that had just rolled out from factories had significant defects, and less than 10% were deemed fit for combat. The documents also indicated that very few made it through the 300-kilometer trial. Furthermore, as the spring of 1943 approached, over 30% of the T-34s were lost as they came near the combat area around Kursk. The Armored Directorate of the Red Army concluded that the average lifespan of a T-34 was little more than 200 kilometers, which meant that they did not even have time to empty their first diesel tank. Despite its faults, the latest version of the T-34 medium tank became a formidable opponent during the latest stages of the war, especially when Germany proved unable to keep up with the production numbers of its communist enemy. All in all, the main advantage of the T-34 over many World War II tanks was that it embodied the Soviet doctrine of a simplistic design that could be easily produced by the thousands, thanks to the sheer amount of slave labor the USSR had at its disposal. Over 80,000 T-34s were built between World War II and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, making it the most produced tank of the war and the second most produced tank of all time. Many of them would ultimately see action in the frozen hills of the Korean War, the jungles of Vietnam and Laos, the deserts of Yemen and Congo, or the beachheads of Cuba. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the Soviet T-34 and its combat service during World War II and the Korean War. And hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos. Stay tuned.